So today we're going to be discussing a new topic to the EF show, oceanography. This category of science is actually quite interesting. It not only includes weather, but many other sciences, including biology, chemistry, medical sciences, and even some astronomy. So if you've listened, listened to some of the past episodes, you've probably heard me mention uh, some of these places and projects that are around to help marine life and then some climatology reasons. First, we need to define what oceanography is and why it's so important. So a National Geographic article uh, states that oceanography applies chemistry, geology, meteorology, biology, and other branches of science to the study of the ocean. It is especially important today as climate change, pollution, and other factors are threatening the ocean and its marine life. Oceanography is the study of physical, chemical, and biological features in the ocean, including the ocean's ancient history, its current condition, and even its, fu- and even its future. Indeed, one of the most incre- uh, incredible studies is, you know, of coral in all of these, and that's what we're going to dive into later. But, you know, there's so much that goes behind these that involves so many different branches. So the most critical branches of oceanography today is known as uh, biological oceanography, and it is the study of the ocean's plants and animals and their interactions with the marine environment. It is also about using that information to help leaders make smart choices about policies that affect ocean health. Lessons learned through oceanography affect the ways humans use sea for transportation, food, energy, water, and much more. Oceanographers from around the world are exploring a range of subjects as wide as the ocean itself. Teams of oceanographers are investigating how melting sea ice is changing the feeding and migration patterns of whales that populate the ocean's coldest regions. And honestly, I think this is a huge topic that we need to cover because, I mean, everything starts in our oceans. We worry about, you know, sea level rise and everything. And yes, that is all climate change, but let's look at the direct impacts, looking at the ocean, you know, the ice caps and everything. What's happening there is what's going to be happening with us because, you know, there's the most... uh, types of weather that happen out there. You have things from water spouts, you have like waves that are 40, 50 feet tall that on a coast would be a tsunami, and I mean there's so many other things. Storms, um, you know, the ocean is such a big place for convection, the creation of storms, and you know, so much of that can be, you know, if you look at radar scans over the ocean, you see these massive storms, and even throughout history itself, you see stories of, like, you know, the Mayflower and some of those other ones that weather played a massive impact with, and when you think about what's happening below that top of the water, you know, you think of, there's marine life down there, whales, you have all types of fish, and in some shallower areas, we have coral and other uh, thriving species, but when you apply more water those shallow species won't be able to you know survive in that because if they need let's just say 10 to 18 feet in depth that's all they can survive in that range then if we add another another five feet then we're looking at species that are going to be completely wiped out forever and that's a big deal i mean considering you know uh, the fact that I learned a year or two ago in Hawaii was um, over, I believe it was 80% of the uh, world's oxygen is actually created in the ocean. And you think, okay, it's the Amazon rainforest and stuff, but I mean, when you think of that's the category of above ground things. But look under the ocean, you have, you know, volcano vents, uh, a few other things, tectonic plates, you know, all of that is working together. And so whenever you think about how important the ocean is, it's actually one of Earth's um, most valuable resources. And the same thing goes for deserts. You know, deserts, all that sand and stuff, that's why you can find uh, fossils of fish. And it's because, you know, the deserts were once underwater, most of them at least were. And so, I mean, other than wind erosion, I mean, these places were all underwater. So places like that are going to be ones that are going to support the most um you know, for this whole climate change situation that we're in, they're going to help us out. Looking at deserts and things, it's part of Earth's climate. We need deserts for animals, for different areas of water to run into, and there's a ton of other reasons that we will get into some other time, but that deserves a whole other podcast for that. But the really important study of this is, you know, how are all these different ecosystems running with the 
Earth, you know, what's happening when this happens, when that happens, and, you know, all the CO2, you know, that, that's going to need to be, you know, that's why trees are so important. But when you look, I mean, parts of the ocean, too, are kind of sucking in that CO2. But whenever you look at, you know, the output, the output is much higher at the ocean um, level because of all the fish and everything. I mean, look at corals and so many other products of the sea are what allow, you know, more oxygen to fill up in the atmosphere, which is what we need. Um, and that's also a reason why, you know, you'll see more fire, fires being fueled um, in places that are near coasts, and that's because, you know, you have all that oxygen there. And you can pretty much see, you know, you don't see these massive fires thousands of miles inland. You just see some of them that are, you know, towards the coast. A great example, you have California, these Australia fires. They're all right along the coast, and that's because you have a lot of oxygen. Now, it's not 100% why all that's happening, but that is a supporting factor in it. So teams of oceanographers are investigating how melting sea ice is changing in uh, the feeding and migration patterns of whales that populate the ocean's cold, coldest regions. And oceanography covers more than just living organisms in the sea. A branch of oceanography is called uh, geological oceanography and focuses on the information of uh, you know, formations and uh, seafloor movement and what all happens and changes over time with that. Geological oceanographers are starting to use special GPS technology uh, to map the seafloor and other underwater features. This research can provide critical information such as seismic activity that could lead to more accurate earthquake and tsunami predictions. So all of this is what is going to be important. And What's going to end up happening with this? We're going to end up seeing, you know, a great uh, change in how we can predict seismic activity, especially with these. I mean, we already look at the oceans, but in places um, like I believe it's the Marianas Trench, if I'm saying that right. But, you know, it's a place that it's hundreds and hundreds of feet deep, it might even be a mile or two deep. And those, what well, uh, we could use, will allow us to see, you know, what's happening at the lowest level. And while it's too deep, you know, nothing's really been down there yet, there's so much to explore. Um, you know, only so much of the ocean's been explored yet, and we're already out exploring sp uh, places in space. And so that means we pretty much know a lot more about our own solar system than the planet we actually live on. So I think it's definitely important, uh, astronomy is and everything, and we will, we will have multiple podcasts on astronomy, but, you know, it's a big deal to think about what's happening back here at home. You know, what's happening in the oceans, what's happening uh, with our environment and our climate, and everything is put together really in this weather machine. We, you could separate it into pretty much four categories. You can separate it into the ice caps, you could separate it into oceans, you could just do the atmosphere itself, and then you have the land. And that climate machine is really a complicated system. You know, you have one of those fail, and you end up messing up the entire system. All four of them are just going to be collapsed. I mean, you have the ice caps melt. Well, you're changing not only the water, you're going to be changing the land. So it's two out of the four. And then the direct impacts from that are going to be obviously that was caused by the atmosphere. So there you go. You have all four of them. And there is a great... Uh, documentary that you can watch. It's called the uh, Decoding the Weather Machine, and I highly suggest you watch it. It is a fascinating documentary on, you know, just what all is happening and, you know, how to study it and how many different universities have different models and things. And it's not just a, you know, oceanography type of thing. It covers meteorology, oceanography, obviously, and even up to astronomy. It involves everything. And that's why you really see oceanography and meteorology in intertwined because you know they both kind of rely on each other you have to study the ocean to be able to understand the weather what's happening over the ocean can change so knowing what happens there allows you to predict weather in the future that's how we're able to predict here in the u.s what all is going to be happening you know next week because of the current situations out over the ocean and then uh, vice versa for oceanography you know, we look at these uh, systems of, you know, hurricanes, cyclones, a whole bunch of other things, and whenever you have to account for all that, you look at what damage there is caused to some of those, you know, ecosystems. And that's what this entire study is about. You know, it's all, it's all of that. And, I mean, 
the study much of the earth it's it's a tough task that's why so many fields of science are involved in it you will see companies like nasa spacex while they are all atmospheric and uh you know space studies you will see a lot of them focus on the you know aquatic aspect of it too because it's all connected um, it's very well rounded the sciences uh, that involves knowing information about all the other fields so really if you are looking at being an oceanographer not only do you need to know about you know marine life and be interested in like the biology aspect of it but you need to know about all the other sciences because that's going to change how your study is what you do and even what the future of your field is and knowing these can aid you in your research and accuracy now if you go out there saying okay this amount of rain's going to happen yeah it's not going to be accurate most of the time if you aren't educated on how to predict that so if you're going to be an oceanographer you're going to need to know that and i mean in the field uh, options and many other jobs are available too so you need to know you know what are the conditions going to be a hurricane's coming through next week where i'm currently at what that what is that going to look like in three weeks after all the wind and water and just the you know battering of the coasts and everything what is the ocean going to look like what changes and that's really something you all have to consider and i mean it's it's just, it's amazing to study all that but after this break we're going to look at where oceanographers are making an impact to help save our planet so a great example of some of this research is the Coral Restoration Foundation. And I have a website posted for them so you can go see, you know, maybe support them. But they collect live coral and take it to universities such as Georgia University and actually clone them. So this whole cloning process to give you a generalized overview what you are essentially doing is, you know, going in there and looking at DNA and different chromosomal uh, studies that in, are a very heavily biological involvement in, you know, processes of the body and everything. So you have to study all of that to understand that aspect of it. So they look at that and they uh, actually take that DNA and grow the exact same coral so they will actually combine that and you know with different things and this will allow some of the genetic code to actually be changed and that will produce genetic di diversity and many examples now i mean you know looking at tomatoes their shelf life is quite short and the actual uh, tomatoes themselves will by the time they even get to the store will probably be all mushy but the tomatoes that we have that we have genetically modified it um, allow them to look better have a longer shelf life well if you apply that same logic to looking at you know coral a actual animal um, it's a plant you know you can allow them to withstand things such as you know waves warmer temperatures uh, different scenarios you know different species moving in because of climate change and you know that genetic diversity is not going to uh you know allow them to be completely wiped out there will always be you know some around and they are the largest coral reef restoration organization in the world uh, they were founded in response to the widespread loss of the dominant coral species in the florida reef tract and they are headquartered in key largo florida and a few uh, statements from their website, uh, coral reefs have been around for more than 50 million years, yet they could all be gone by the end of the century. Think about that, 50 million years and we have wiped them out, you know, over, we're looking at 1.5, I mean, even maybe two centuries. That's crazy. And uh, they say that we work to support the reef's natural recovery processes through the large-scale cultivation, outplanting, and modern monitoring uh, of genetically diverse uh, reef-building corals. Uh, they grow corals in an uh, offshore coral tree nursery and then outplant them onto carefully selected sites. In 2007, they now have planted uh, more than 100,000 critically endangered staghorn and elkhorn corals back into the Florida reef tract. Many of these corals have now grown into thriving colonies, which are able to spawn, uh, kickstarting the reef's natural process of recovery. They work with 303 coral genotypes across 11 species. That is to ensure that they are restoring the reef's genetic diversity and resilience. And that's all crazy looking at that. I mean, you think about that. It's, it's groups of people like that. Noah even, you know, involved in all of that. They're all going to be helping out each other. And, I mean, 
ever no matter what field of science you're in you're gonna be kind of persuaded to help out with this because with everything that's gonna apply to you and even as a normal person that's why you should donate to these because they are helping uh you know the our ecosystems they're helping you they're helping the future of um earth itself and you know maybe we could reverse all these effects of you know what we've caused and maybe eventually you know we won't have to re even look at maybe moving to a different planet ever we could just focus on you know what's happening here at home fixing that and then living keep going with it and uh, they also work with government agencies including NOAA they work with universities NGOs and many others so it's great to see the collaboration between these companies because that's going to be important that teamwork acts uh, aspect of everything is going to be the most important thing to uh, accomplish this mission and this one this next this next example is actually one of my uh, favorites to actually go and visit it's the uh, clearwater aquarium in florida and uh, if you've ever seen the dolphin tail movie that movie is a real story and actually comes from a dolphin at this aquarium so the entire movie is about basically a dolphin that they rehabilitate. They actually have to make a tail for it, given the name Dolphin Tail. And uh, it's the whole story of how that whole process happened, the success of it. And that's what made this uh, little tiny aquarium uh, be put on the global map. So if you've ever, ever actually been to this aquarium, it is amazing. All the animals are uh, being helped out and cured. So they have shows and that type of thing, but they uh, have many different species. It's not just down to dolphins and a few other small aquatic species. Um, they have all of these being helped out currently. Dolphins, pelicans, sea turtles, otters, sharks, stingrays, eels, shrimp, burfish, clownfish, look downs, hogfish, red drumfish, and tarpons. So that they have a you know very diverse uh, catalog of species at this place. You know, being able to see all of them being helped out, it's a good thing. And uh, the rehabilitation stories are all there, so you could take tours where they even study some fish. And there's a there's a, even a tour to an island that it's not really an island, I should say. It's actually kind of more of a sandbar. Um, and it you can find some shells on it and you can really learn a lot by spending even a few hours there and it's right along there on the Clearwater beach and so while you're taking your vacation down there maybe take a few hours to go there and explore it's not really a whole day thing considering there's only that many species there but um, it is a really good time for like maybe a third or even half a day uh, trip but places like this are amazing um, this place has volunteers helping out to rehabilitate these animals year-round. Many of them return to the open seas, and those who are in permanent uh, you know, residency there seem to have an almost five-star aquatic hotel um, as it attends to all their needs. They also have uh, shows and many other events that animals get involved with that is very fun for the whole family. And they have shows with the dolphins, the turtles, and many other things there that you can learn out of. Um, it is a great experience. I, I highly suggest that you go there. It is uh, the projects and aquariums like these all over the world that are helping not only the ocean, but those animals that live in them. It is amazing to see how people uh, you know, are able to help out and you know, how many projects there currently are. And how you can get involved is very simple. You can just donate even, um, make it basic, you know, down there. Um, and that will support people who are going there to help things. And all of this is helping to combat climate change. And that um, the immediate effects of it are crucial for the future of the world's ecosystems. Now more than ever, our uh, world is changing. And, you know, all of this helping out in all these different categories of science, if you can help out with all of those, you know, that'll improve everybody's lives. And, I mean, even the animals, I mean, that's a direct thing right there at that aquarium that you see these, some of these animals, including some of the turtles there, they've seen with plastic and things, and that's a big problem. And it, that's a whole other episode, too, that we'll be doing on the Pacific Garbage Patch. But, you know, these animals all around the world are being affected by what uh, human-made products are. And that's not really saying, okay, go all organic, but that's just saying that watch what you do with, you know, your trash and even, you know, voting for the good climate policies that are going to help improve uh, the climate in which you live. So it's all very important. And that's why I really like this topic of studying all that is because, you know, there's so much that you can intertwine with meteorology and all of science that is just good that you can learn. It's all good stuff. So 
it's just amazing to see all that and the results of it. So yeah, that's that's gonna pretty much do it for the oceanography aspect of it. But let's go ahead and look at uh, this week in weather news. So this week in weather news, many places that haven't been getting snow have gotten a couple of inches in the past few storms. And that is very important uh, for much of the country. Um, looking at places even like New York and uh, Philadelphia and D.C. and a few other major cities over there, Boston, um, if you add them all up. They don't have as much snow as places in Texas do, and that's just crazy. That This year's winter has been so weird, and it's hard to connect that really to climate change. Now, the warmth and how hot it does get, yes, that is a connection, but the fact of snowfall, it's weird really this year with all the jet streams, how they've been lining up, and that's, uh, you know, it's partially because of the warming, but, you know, it's just how the systems have been running recently with the severe weather in the south. And then, you know, you have all this snow going north of the jet stream, but everything south of it is getting pretty much nothing. So it's a very weird winter this year. Places um, in the south, like Atlanta and other uh, South Carolina and northeast Missis Mississippi cities, saw some snow with last week's system. Many... Um, People got video of, you know, the snow accumulating on the ground. I don't know off the top of my head how much they actually got, but it was impressive to see all that. And climate models presented a pretty boring second half of February. Not many, um, if any, huge nationwide storms are going to be happening. So don't be expecting too many crazy uh, stories, reports. There are some severe weather chances, but don't be expecting, you know, three feet of snow. Severe weather threats across the south uh, seem to be happening almost every day now. And as we are in the second tornado season, numbers of severe storms could rise due to our rising uh, temperatures at the end of the month. And as we're near the end of the month, it's time to start thinking about spring. And, you know, meteorological spring starts here at the end of the month, or I guess it's the first day of March. So, you uh, you know, we're going to start seeing some more severe storms. And could severe uh, threats like this start to make its way into the northwest where um, an early tornado alley season is possible? We could be seeing this at the end of the month. Hard to tell right now, but it's definitely a possibility. And this year already feels like one of those years where storms and tornadoes will last from the beginning of the spring all the way into the early fall. So it, um, my feeling of it, it's going to be a long season. And with all of that, it's a very important to make sure that you are prepared for the severe weather as we approach severe season. While meteorological spring starts the 1st of March, you have to note that you know that's not when the earth is you know tilted that way. That's just when we start seeing the most weather like that. So as we start to get closer, we're inching closer, we're going to start seeing more and more of these severe threats with outbreaks of tornadoes. So going over the next month or two, I'd say probably uh, mid to late March is when we'll start seeing a few um, bigger systems with some more tornadoes start to make its way into the plains. But be prepared for April because a Mar uh, March, end of March, uh, all of April and all of May are really when that season starts to pick up. And then as you get into April and May, that is the heaviest part of the tornado season. So always be prepared for that. Have your NOAA ready, uh, radios ready. And uh, the great resource for that is to go to the National Weather Service, their website, because they will have everything on there that is suggested that you should have prepared and uh, some good resources on you know what generalized information there is. And you can start looking, if you want to be like a storm spotter, you can join the storm spotter program, uh, Skywarn, that has ran across the nation. And it's the public eye like that that really allows the National Weather Service to see and make predictions and have all that information to make sure people are staying safe and they're getting a better lead times on storms. So it's definitely important for all of that. And it's crazy, you know, how fast this year's going already. But all of this is all important, you know, all the sciences and everything and studying all of this because it's going to allow us to, you know, for the climate change part to improve all that. And then looking at direct, you know, uh, for meteorology, improve lead time on storms. And it's all kind of coalesced into a generalized science of the atmosphere and everything. So really, that's about it for this episode. I uh, really like talking about that, and it's a really interesting topic. Um, check out those links. so You can probably see them on the cards. I will also have them in the description. Um, if you want to go check out those uh, websites and maybe read up some more about it, donate. It would be wonderful if you could do that. Um, and that is going to be um, you know, a very crucial science uh, study for the future. 
So I highly suggest you look into those and be prepared for the spring because you never know. Um, the most common thing is everyone says on the news, they never expected it. It would be them that are hit. They, these things are unpredictable right now. You can't see them a month ahead. It's a day or two, and that's uh, re not really enough time. So always be prepared for that. And yeah, um, I want to thank you all again for listening or watching if you're watching this on YouTube. Um yeah, really excited for the spring and everything. A few more educational videos are uh, being created right now. We will start posting those coming up here with the beginning of uh, Meteorological Spring right around the corner. So make sure you check those out on the YouTube channel, link in the description. And we will have our Twitter and our Instagram there too that you can check out updates and live posts on Twitter of what's currently going on. Uh, a few updates on the website where we're talking about the EF Network website. Um, that is going a little bit slower than expected, so we should uh, be able to put that up there um, probably by uh, the middle to end of spring. Um, just a few little tweaks we're working out um, with some things on the website to make it a easier experience for you, so you don't have to look for the uh, information as much. It will all be accessible from that home page. So thank you all again, and I hope you'll join us next time on the EF Show, and make sure to check out any videos or uh, any forecasts that we are posting on our YouTube and Twitter page. Thank you all again, and have a great day.